From New York to our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. This is Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We start, as we do every day, pretty much, with a check on the markets. With that, we go to Kaylee Lines. Kaylee, just look in. It looks like equities are up a little bit, but not a whole lot. Yeah, not huge moves today, David, but there definitely is a risk on tone. A lot of optimism out there, it seems, on the prospects for a fiscal aid package coming out of Capitol Hill. That seems to be offsetting any kind of risk off sentiment surrounding the fact that we are continuing to see weaker data. 885,000 Americans filing for first time unemployment benefits last week, but stimulus hopes seem to take precedent over that. You have the S&P and the Nasdaq at all time highs. Within the S&P 500, it's materials that is the best performing sector that has a lot to do with the fact that copper is rallying up 1% today. Uh, and I would note too, David, that the dollar continues to weaken the dollar right around its lowest since back in April of 2018, weaker against everything in the G10 space. The Fed yesterday doing nothing to change that equation. And I would point out, David, that the Fed didn't change that much of the equation for the bond market either. There was a lot of talk going into the Fed decision that if it disappointed the markets, didn't extend its maturity, that you could see the 10-year yield move back above 1%. That did not happen, though we are seeing yields ticking higher today by about two basis points. Still, though, sitting around 93 basis points. The expectation seems to be that even though the Fed didn't move the move, make the move yesterday, it will do so in the future, David. Kelly, thank you so very much. That's Kelly Lyons reporting on the markets. Well, the Fed yesterday, as Kelly was talking about, uh, saw at least some brighter prospects ahead for the U.S. economy in the new year. But at the same time, Fed Chair Jay Powell said that they are not going to back off of their aggressive bond buying program until they see what he called substantial improvement in the economy, both with respect to employment and with respect to inflation. To lay out exactly what this does for the economy, and for that matter, for the markets, we turn now to BlackRock's Rick Reeder, where he is Chief Investment Officer for Global Fixed Income, as well as the head of their global asset allocation. So, Rick, thanks so much for being back with us. I guess my basic question is, did the language they use really do something to support the economy? I mean, I, well, I mean, they're they're on a persistent movement to support the economy. I think there was a, there was a lot of analysis yesterday that that said that the Fed was hawkish because they didn't increase the weighted average maturity, or they didn't actually increase the asset purchase program. Anybody who describes this Fed as hawkish is so misguided. This is a Fed that is just going to continue to be there and be as accommodative. They you know they said they're going to continue the asset purchase program at least as large both in treasuries and mortgages. By the way, I don't even think they need to increase mortgages at all. In fact, I think they could shrink them. But they're going to they're keep going, and they're going to be incredibly supportive of the new administration and fiscal stimulus from here. Well, let's pick up on that exactly, Rick. Why are they uh, sticking with this allocation for mortgages? You know, I, I mean, I, I actually, well, I think the Fed's doing a brilliant job. This, I don't think they need to do that. I mean, if you think about more, there aren't enough mortgages to purchase from what they're what they're doing. The banks are dying for those assets, and uh, and the levels are incredibly low. And even if they slow down the purchase program, rates aren't mortgage rates aren't moving higher. The demand for mortgage product is incredible. And then you take the other side of it, the housing market is in incredibly good shape. And if you think about it, you know one of the things that is a risk for a particularly lower and middle income is the housing market is doing so well that you'll continue to see increased home prices, which I would argue that is the one part of inflation that I actually think is real. And, it, and quite frankly, it's burdensome to a lot of the economy and a lot of particularly lower and middle income. So anyway, that part I don't, other than signaling, we're just not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna pull any accommodation. Um, I don't think they need to do that. So, so as I say, the message out of the Fed I thought yesterday was we think in 2021 it's going to start getting better, presumably in large part because of the vaccine, which we're hoping for so much. At the same time, there's a real divergence, maybe even a bifurcation in the marketplace, whether it's individuals or it's companies, between some people who are doing very, very well and some people who are doing very, very badly. Yeah, I mean, David, you hit the nail on the head. Listen, but I think this is, you know, what the central bank does is you know its tools are blunt, and a lot of what happens is it lifts financial assets and it creates a this bifurcation as you described. And it doesn't, you know, what the Fed can do is it sort of paves the runway for for other policy to come in. Now you really need the fiscal, and the fiscal is where you can direct tax policy, where you can direct where the stimulus gets to, things like state and local, things like healthcare spending. Uh, education spending, et cetera, things that can actually close that gap. I mean, you know, now we ha we actually are going to get what I think, particularly when you think about Chair Yellen, I still call her Chair Yellen, the uh, the Treasury Secretary, 
And, and now you've got functionally two Fed chairs that are going to operate in concert with one another. And that's where you get really effective policy when, when fiscal and monetary work hand in glove with one another. So is that constructive or does that undermine the independence of the Fed? I mean, how closely do you want the two of them to operate together? You've called it sort of pilot and co-pilot. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I do believe in the in the independence, and and I certainly know that people at the Fed really believe in the independence of the Fed. However, you know, you you do create some coordination. Uh, by the way, having where they're, where they're not talking, that is a that is a problem. Um, but having some coordination coordination makes sense, particularly as you described earlier. We've got a problem in the country today. We need to put more people to work. You know, until vaccines starts to really get implemented, we need to put more people to work, and we need to stabilize an economy, an employment dynamic that is real. And so, you know, that that idea that the Fed's going to neutralize the debt that the uh, that the that the fiscal is going to put on. And by the way, I, you know, I think I think you have Larry Summers going to talk about this. Their paper that they wrote on the system can actually withstand more debt is a hundred percent right. And as long as, and a big part of it is the Fed is keeping rates low, so the interest burden on the economy is not onerous. Yeah, no question. I mean, this goes to Larry Summers' secular stagnation, that the problem we have is too much savings, not too little, that we need to actually be investing and spending some money. The question always is, Rick, isn't it, how do you spend that money? Okay, you can borrow it really cheap, but it depends on how you, how you spend it or invest it. Uh, it's definitely right. I mean, by the way, I think we're at a point in time today, what Larry says is dead right, is the amount of savings. I mean, you think about the liquidity in the system, um, what's been created, the aging demographic. I know we've talked about for years, pensions, life insurance companies, the, need, the ability to fund is extraordinary. Savings do outweigh the assets by a lot. And that's why you're seeing appreciation in so many assets across, uh, across different markets. But you're right. I mean, there's different return on equities, as it were, uh, uh, return on equity possibilities, spending on how the government spends the money. I actually think we're at a point in time today that the velocity of tax dollars working their way through that, that comes on the backside of fiscal, um, quite frankly, lowers the bar for what those returns need to be for those government programs. But like you say, some are obviously much more efficacious than others. And uh, but I truly think that that, quite frankly, most of the fiscal stimulus you put in today is going to is going to create a velocity and, and which impacts the monetary base um, that the Fed has created in a very positive way. So, Rick, you have two hats at BlackRock, both uh, Chief Investment Officer for fixed, Global Fixed Income, but also Asset Allocation. So put mm -hmm. some money to work here. Given that situation, the way you view the world, what's going on, what you expect, what, where are the investment opportunities? Where is it smart to put money right now? So it gets harder every day, but I don't know. I feel like coming in every year, it's always hard. So, uh, you know, but I listen, I think the equity market's going higher. I think when people look at you can keep when the Fed says we'll keep interest rates down and we're going to leave them down for a long period of time. It makes, uh, it, you know, makes you know, where rates have gotten to. It doesn't make the Treasury market interesting. It doesn't make, as we said, the mortgage market interesting. That that we are when rates stay where they are. That is a direct injection of value into equities and allows companies to finance them for M and A, for capex, for R and D, et cetera. So the equity market is going to go higher. I'm I'm pretty convinced of that. And then how do you create balance in the portfolio? You know, I would argue hold some cash. Hold some of your, uh, you know, government rate risk, and, you know, your, your government, uh, the, the government debt you own in tips to get some inflation protection, and then get yield into the portfolio. You know, we're trying to. It's getting harder and harder to get yield, but the credit market, parts of the emerging markets, parts of the securitized market, you know, get some yield, run a bit more cash because it's harder to hedge today given where rates are, and um, and then and then own the equity market because equities. I think equities are going higher. I don't think you know. Hear the story of, you know, why equities are fully valued. I think people who just do equities don't see fixed income and don't see the benefit getting to the equity. And uh, I think equities have got some upside to them. Doesn't say we can't trade down for a period of time, but but I think they're going higher. Rick, you led me right to it. If we're looking to diversify our investments, what about Bitcoin? We we had Scott Miner tell Bloomberg yesterday. You know Scott say he thinks mm -hmm. Bitcoin should go to four hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, I think putting a number on Bitcoin as a valuation is hard. Uh, I, you know, I don't know there's an algorithm. I don't know. I just think, listen, I think there's a demand that outstrips supply today for, and you know, particularly when you're seeing debt printing, not just in the U.S. and Europe and, uh, and other parts of the world. So, listen, I think there's clearly greater demand than supply. I think storehouse of value, you're seeing it somewhat in gold today. But I think storehouse of value is a, is a, is a and, and listen, I think millennials have, uh, have definitely adopted uh, Bitcoin is one of the ways you get that storehouse of values. So, listen, I wouldn't say 
it should be at this price or that price because I just don't know how you could determine that. But it, it does strike me it's going to be part of the asset uh, the, the asset suite for uh, for investors for a long time. Rick, you said that equities look pretty good and maybe going to get better given what the Fed is doing, particularly with the interest rates. What about within equities? Is it time to really make that big rotation away from some of the tech names that have done so well for the last year or two and into some of the more cyclicals if we're anticipating that vaccine? So I, so I think there's tech and there's tech. I mean, I think, like you say, some of the names, particularly big tech, has had a really, really good run. And I think about it as a story, 2020 was ride the, ride the coattails of big tech. I said, I think they'll be fine. I think they should still be part of the portfolio, but not too nearly not as much as they, uh, as they were. But I'm still a big believer. Things like software, semiconductors, things that are aligned with, uh, with artificial intelligence, cloud, et cetera, data assimilation. You know, you saw play out this week in the number of names that came to market. I still like those names, but then I like, you know, and take some of that big tech that we've rotated down, go into some of the cyclicals, which will continue to do well. And whether that's in manufacturing, housing, we talked about through home builders, home improvement. And, um, you know, I actually think, you know, the, you know, post vaccine, you're going to see things like leisure, gaming, that um, you know, there's, there's some real upside. So I do think taking some more cyclical risk and, you know, riding the consumer, because I think the consumer is going to continue to be in good shape. So consumer durables, are a winner, and that, you know, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big believer in, the, in there's a big value rotation. I'd rather buy the companies that are cyclically oriented, and they'll participate in the upside. Some of those are value, and some of those aren't. Rick, it's always a treat to get to talk to you. That is Rick Reeder Thanks, of BlackRock. Thanks so very much. Coming up next, we're going to be inching toward that stimulus deal, talking to Don Beyer. He's the Democratic congressman from Northern Virginia. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. A coronavirus relief deal appears close at hand. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he's hoping an agreement can be reached today as lawmakers put the finishing touches on a nearly $900 billion agreement. Leader McConnell says it's highly likely the Senate will need to work this weekend and pass a very short stopgap funding bill. Pfizer and U.S. drug uh, regulators are revising guidelines concerning the company's COVID-19 vaccine after rare allergic reactions were seen in some recipients. Officials say two people in Alaska who received the vaccine suffered reactions, which were also seen in some vaccine recipients in the U.K. This as an FDA advisory panel is meeting to decide whether to recommend a second coronavirus vaccine. Parts of the U.S. Northeast are digging out of the first major snowstorm of the season. The system dumped a foot or more in some areas. More than 10 inches of snow fell here in New York City. Parts of western New York were buried under more than three feet of snow. The storm hit as trucks carrying Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine from Michigan fanned out across the country, but officials say the weather will have little impact on vaccination efforts. Russia was banned today from using its name, flag, and anthem at the next two Olympics or at any world championships for the next two years. Russian athletes and teams will still be allowed to compete at next year's Tokyo Olympics and the 2022 Winter Games in Beijing. It was the most severe penalties imposed on Russia since allegations of state-backed doping and cover-ups emerged after the 2014 Sochi Olympics. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Mark. Well, it appears that after seven months of impasse, as Mark just said, we may be getting past the roadblocks to a fourth round of stimulus. Here to bring us up to speed on what's going on is Democratic Congressman Don Beyer from Virginia. He serves as the vice chair of the Joint Economic Committee. So welcome, Congressman. Great to have you back with us. Give us your sense of where this negotiation stands right now. We heard from Mitch McConnell. He thinks they could have a deal today. Yeah, this is the most optimistic I've been in six months, David. Uh, it, it looks like you know, the, the big hangups have been, um, as Democrats, we really wanted uh, more money for state and local governments. They've laid off a million workers. 
but the Republicans really wanted this gross negligence shield for liability for companies. And there was just no way of getting over it. So they pulled those two out, put them in a separate bill. It's not clear that we'll even vote on that bill. But what's left is about $900 billion, including uh, more money for the unemployed, you know, 300 bucks a week for the next 10 weeks, and another $600 check for, for people below a certain income level, and probably most importantly, a big chunk of money for vaccines. So, so in the nature of a compromise, you don't get everything you want. It sounds like both sides are getting, not getting something that they wanted. Is it enough? And particularly, is it enough for the workers, for the people around the country who are really facing food insecurity, housing insecurity, a lot of risk, and small businesses, goodness knows. I mean, you're a businessman yourself. You built your own business. Uh, is it enough? Uh, I don't think it is. In, in fact, you look at the initial claims this morning that jumped up to 885000 uh, and that was, you know, supposedly seasonally adjusted. So we're looking for unemployment new claims in January, more than a million a week. And that that's a level we haven't hit since last May. So no, it's not enough. But uh, once again, this is the the art of the possible. Um, and we're going to hit another cliff in ten weeks when we have a lot of people still unemployed and the unemployment insurance has gone away. Um, so that's a it's a Which little raises a question. But which raises the question, Congressman, do you anticipate the need to come back for more stimulus, perhaps, fiscal stimulus, in the new year with the new Congress? Oh, uh, I absolutely do. because I, And I think part of our optimism, and it may be misplaced optimism, is that with Joe Biden in place, and we see what happens in those Georgia Senate elections, that we get another bite at the apple. Um, and we're also very much hoping that the Republican governors and mayors and county board members finally start beating up the Republican senators about getting money for state and local governments. Uh, tell me about the situation in your home district in Virginia. Uh, where is the greatest need? Um, you know, but I saw I'm Arlington, Alexandria, you know, right across the river. And they've seen basically 15 to 25 percent drops in revenue. Uh, you know, a lot of not uh, real estate taxes are doing fine. It's mostly the, the retail sales taxes, gas taxes, things like that. Um, and so they've just laid off a lot of people. And that's why you know, we've been calling it the HEROES Act since last summer, because the, the people that lose their state and local jobs are uh, the trash men and the child protective service workers and police and fire and zoning things get slowed down. So all the things that give us that quality of life. As you look at the need to rebuild, re build back better, is I think the way President-elect uh, Biden is putting it right now, uh, in the Biden administration, how do you think it's going to be different than managing the economy? What do you look forward to? Um, I, I think the biggest thing will be, you know, if we look backwards, and maybe not everybody wants to hear this, but there's a great Bloomberg piece just published last night, a couple of uh, British economists that looked at 35 different countries and whether cutting taxes stimulated economic growth. And their conclusion was absolutely not. And we saw that huge $2 trillion tax cut and job act, and the economy kept growing at the same rate it was before and the same rate basically that it did until the coronavirus. So I think we're going to have a much greater emphasis on investment. So think a big infrastructure package, uh, more money for education, especially those folks who've been left out of the economy, you know, high school education or less. And I'm hoping... Uh, a much more expansive trade policy that depends less on on tariffs and more on new agreements with Europe, with uh, Pacific Rim nations, folks like that. If the tax cuts may have been a mistake at the time, in retrospect, does that mean in this economy, given the parallel situation, it makes sense to actually reverse some of those and increase some taxes to pay for some of that investment? Uh, no, I think we'll be very reluctant to do that in the short run or even in the middle run. Um, you're right, with, with maybe 30 million people unemployed, um, even if we can argue that the 21 percent corporate tax rate was way too low, I think we're going to be very reluctant to move it back to 27 or 28 until the economy is really moving again. You know, the, the, I think most of us think that the austerity measures of 2011 were premature. The austerity measures going back before we were born and 36, 37 were premature. Let's make sure that, that we're moving back towards full employment before we start thinking about um, reigning in the deficit. Interest rates are, are close to zero and will be for the foreseeable future. We can afford this uh, in the middle term. 
Congressman, it's always a treat to have you with us. Thank you very much for joining us. That is Democratic Congressman Don Beyer of the state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia, I really should say. Okay, coming up, uh, there's a Roku rally going on as they finally get that deal with AT&T. That's our stock of the hour. It's next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Stock of the Hour. It is Roku, which has a new streaming deal, which has helped its stock, as I understand it. But Emma Chandra knows the whole story. She's here to tell it to us. Thanks very much, David. Yes, it is the big, the U.S.'s biggest streaming TV provider. That is Roku uh, hitting a record high today. The stock up some 8% at the highs, uh, paired a little now to 4%, but still, as I said, trading at its highest level uh, since the company went public back in 2017. And as you alluded to there, it really is deal news that is uh, uh, pushing the stock uh, to these highs today. As we heard, it has uh, struck a deal with AT&T uh, to carry its HBO Max app. Now, HBO Max. It's a relative newcomer when it comes to content providers launching uh, back in May, but it has signed up about 12 million customers uh, since then, a relative minnow compared with Netflix, but that has been a pretty speedy uh, uh, way of uh, signing up customers. And it's pretty timely as well because what we're hearing is HBO Max due to stream uh, the new Wonder Woman movie on Christmas Day on the same day uh, that it will arrive in theaters. And that's seen as a real moment to sign up new customers, both through both for HBO Max through the Roku platform, but also for Roku itself. And Bloomberg Intelligence saying uh, that this could be a way, this deal with HBO Max could be a way for it to push its subscriber or active account base up past 50 million. It uh, currently has about 46 million. And, and David, Roku been doing very well throughout uh, the global pandemic. Of course, really intensified at the moment. Everybody's staying at home and they need some sort of platform to watch uh, all those movies and TV shows. That's what I'm spending my time doing. I don't know what you're doing, Emma, but thank you so much for that report on Roku as our stock of the hour. Coming up, the vaccines are on their way, but we've got a rough time to go until we get there. We're going to talk with one of the people who's helping us get there. She is Dr. Sheila Davis. She is the CEO of Partners in Health, leading the way on testing and tracing. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We're going to go now to Mark Crumpton with Bloomberg First Word News. David, President-elect Biden's cabinet picks are beginning to work through the confirmation process. The Senate Finance Committee has sent questionnaires to Janet Yellen, whom Mr. Biden has chosen to be Treasury Secretary, and Javier Becerra has picked to run the Department of Health and Human Services. That could potentially lead to some cabinet members being confirmed on Inauguration Day or shortly afterward. Members of the Congressional Watchdog Panel are asking for an investigation into Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin's decision to end Federal Reserve emergency lending programs. In a letter to Treasury's acting inspector general seen by Bloomberg News, Democrats say Mnuchin might not have consulted with legal counsel and may have changed his position on the programs after Joe Biden won the election. The European Parliament has set a Sunday deadline for negotiators to reach a post-Brexit trade deal as they battle over fishing rights. It's the one major issue standing in the way of an agreement. Officials say this is the last chance for an agreement to be ratified before the transition period expires on December 31st. The European Union's chief Brexit negotiator said today there has been progress, but that this last stumbling block remains. Canada's population growth ground to a halt in the third quarter after travel restrictions and closed borders prevented most forms of immigration. Statistics Canada reported today that the country's population was essentially unchanged during the period, up about 2,700 or just over 38 million. It was the slowest increase in data going back to 1946. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. 
I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, every single day seems to bring new news about vaccines, but also new instances of COVID-19 infections and hospitalizations and, yes, deaths. The question then is, how do we get from the current crisis to the time when we can start to get our lives back together again? Well, Partners in Health is leading the way in that with its pioneering in, the, in testing and in tracing across the country. We welcome now the CEO of Partners in Health. She is Dr. Sheila Davis. So, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for being with us. Before we get to the testing and tracing, give us your take on where we are on vaccines. We expect to hear later today from the expert panel on the Moderna vaccine, probably approved tomorrow. How far away are from really widespread uh, distribution of the vaccine. Uh, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to be here. You know, vaccines, I think we're very optimistic, but still best case scenario, we're a number of months away for having full coverage, certainly in the U.S. And globally, even we're even much further off, which is really alarming. So that does raise the question, how do we get from here to there? Because we have a real crisis on our hands right now. Give us a sense of what you are doing at Partners in Health. Yeah, in the U.S., we've been working closely, certainly through the in the state of Massachusetts at the invitation of Governor Baker, and then in 11 other jurisdictions in the U.S. who have asked us to come in and help. And we've taken lessons learned from our work around the world in Haiti and Sierra Leone and other places on how to actually do contact tracing as one piece of a comprehensive plan. We really need a strong public health system. And this COVID-19 has illuminated, I think, that in the U.S. we're really lacking a robust public health response. Well, that's one of the interesting things here. I heard someone say, I think Larry Summers actually said, we've overinvested in private health, underinvested in public health. As you say, uh, Partners in Health originated really in Haiti, but you've done extensive work in other countries, including Rwanda, elsewhere around the world. What can we learn from some of the less developed countries that can really be applied and we need here in the United States of America? Yeah, I think it's a great question. You know, there's a lot we can learn. We know that other countries that do not have the same investment in health have done much better through this pandemic. And I think a lot of it is because there is a comprehensive healthcare system that does have a public health model that includes contact tracing, that includes much more of people embedded in the community, like community health workers. We still need high tech ICUs in all the places that we work, but we definitely can have lessons learned from Rwanda, which has done a fantastic pandemic control and other places and how do we infuse those into the US health system and really build a system that's not reliant just on hospitals um, as the pinnacle of all of the healthcare. We've seen the testing ramp up from very, very modest origins, and now it, it seems to be moving along in most of the United States. At the same time, I wonder about the tracing part of it, because I know you're very involved in that. We have reports, for example, out of uh, New Jersey, for example, uh, where we had reports from Governor Murphy that maybe 70 percent of the people contacted don't comply, don't cooperate in helping with the tracing. You know, I think what we've found is that when people are, when we're able to also assess what their needs are, a lot of people are not able to isolate or quarantine safely if they uh, don't have the social support that's needed. People need diapers, people need formula, people need food. So a core component of what we embedded in the Massachusetts program, as well as um, with other places we're working, is that there's a, a direct connection to when our contact tracers reach out, which is the advantage of versus a text or some other type of, of tech option, and assessing, do people need help? Do they need a place to stay where they can safely isolate from their family members? So it, it really is, um, it has to be a, a more of a safety net model. So I think most people do want to comply, but many people don't have the ability to have a separate wing in their home home or a separate way to have food brought in. Now, that sounds like a pretty labor-intensive effort. As you say, it's not just a technological fix of figuring out who's got it and who might give it to somebody, but how do we support you? In fact, you have it and you have to isolate or you have to quarantine somehow. How labor-intensive is this? How many people do you have working on this? You know, in Massachusetts, in, in collaboration with, with other members of the state agencies, which has been a phenomenal experience for us, and we've learned a lot, 
We have um, now over 2,000 people who are working on this effort, but really they're people who are picking up the phone, talking to people, um, you know, assessing what their needs are and connecting them to existing resources in the state. So a lot of it was not, certainly some new money was infused for the social support efforts, but part of it was also making sure that we're connecting the dots. And if we look at the overall cost of, of what it costs to have robust public health programs, it's much cheaper in the long run than a, a few days, weeks, or months in a hospital, which is the most expensive place certainly to have care. How widely distributed is, is this in the United States? I mean, you've mentioned Massachusetts. I remember the governor of Massachusetts at the news conference announcing early on that he was going to turn to partners and help to help them on the tracing. How far beyond Massachusetts has it gone? So we're now currently working in 11 different jurisdictions, and it's anywhere from states to counties to working with mayor's office um, offices. And we're also taking lessons learned and having a learning collaborative, which is an open sourced ability for um, lessons learned to be shared from Illinois to North Carolina in a, in a way that we're continuing to learn from each other. So we have staff embedded in all of these different places, and they are providing technical support. They're looking looking at um, connecting for convening for knowledge sharing. And also we're really um, uh, committed to advocacy and that we're using this moment to also look at how do we have a better health system in the US that really focuses on those who are who need it most and those who have been most disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. It would be great if we could learn something from this crisis that takes us beyond the pandemic. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. Thank really you. great to have you with us. That's Dr. Sheila Davis. She's CEO of Partners in Health. Coming up, we're going to talk with a former FDA commissioner who is now at Duke. He is Dr. Mark McClellan. We're going to talk to him about the approval that's expected tomorrow of the second vaccine, and that is one from Moderna. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The FDA is expected to permit emergency use of a second vaccine, this one from Moderna, as early as tomorrow. There are several vaccine candidates out there. And to take us through the field right now, we turn to Dr. Mark McClellan. He is founding director of the Duke Margola Center. He's also a former FDA commissioner. So, doctor, thank you so much for being back with us. First of all, is it pretty sure, do we think at this point, that Moderna will get approval tomorrow? David, it sure looks that way. The FDA's analysis of the Moderna data that it presented this morning at the advisory committee meeting, an independent expert advisory committee meeting, was very positive on approval or authorization of the vaccine for emergency use. The issues that are coming up now involve things like uh, the rare side effects that have been observed with the Pfizer vaccine, these allergic reactions, which do turn out to be manageable if, if serious, and no other big uh, roadblocks are, are turning up in the discussion so far. So like you said, I expect uh, approval very soon after that meeting based on everything we're seeing so far. So if that happens, that means we have two horses in this race, uh, one from Pfizer and BioNTech and the other from Moderna. Uh, is that enough or do we need more? I know Johnson & Johnson is working on a version. Various people are. AstraZeneca's had a little uh, hiccups along the way. Yeah, we, we do need more. So this is going to make a big difference, though. Uh, um, the uh, Moderna vaccine expects to be able to deliver millions more doses this month and into next month. So remember, the first priority for vaccination across the country has been frontline healthcare workers and people who are residents or working in nursing homes has been really hard hit, including in this latest surge. That'll probably take till the first part of January to finish those vaccinations. And then with maybe um, uh, 50 million or uh, 30 to 50 million uh, doses of the Moderna and um, uh, Pfizer vaccines available in, in January, it'll be many more people vaccinated. You mentioned the J&J &J vaccine, and I'm on the board of J&J, &J, so I know a, a bit about uh, what's going on there. That uh, trial is just about completed in enrollment, and so watching to see what happens. And with, unfortunately, so much COVID activity in the country, that means it's going to figure out faster just how well uh, that vaccine works. So that could be 
uh, reporting out data by late January, early February, and could be available soon after. That's going to be another 100 million doses over the first quarter or so of 2021, if that works out. You mentioned the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's the fourth one that could be potentially uh, providing additional access in the U.S. There have been some uh, bumps in the clinical trials. They're doing some further clinical studies to meet U.S. standards. I expect that one may be approved if it stays on track in Europe first. That will be some additional data that we can use here. Then that would add to the vaccine availability heading into February, March, April. So perhaps by the uh, end of the first quarter or so, uh, most people who have high risk for COVID, that includes uh, all other types of frontline or essential workers and people in high risk groups like the elderly or with uh, serious chronic conditions, uh, they could have access by first quarter or so, and then more adults, more of the rest of us uh, into the second quarter of next year uh, across those three to four vaccines. But to keep that pace, J&J does need need to get their vaccine authorized and the AstraZeneca vaccine would help as well. Doctor, come back for a moment to the Pfizer-BioNTech, which is the one that's being distributed right now. There was a report yesterday I saw of an allergic reaction, I think up in yeah. Alaska. We knew there were issues of anaphylactic uh, allergies, but this seemed not to be related to that. Is that cause for some concern? Is there an allergy problem? Well, you know, FDA is investigating that now, and in fact, it came up at that um, advisory committee meeting on the Moderna vaccine this morning. We're not completely sure what in the vaccine uh, may have caused that very rare but but serious reaction. Uh, looks like at least one of the people in Alaska had a strong history of uh, of severe allergies. At this point, though, based on all the data we've seen, there's no reason that to uh, expect that people who may have food allergies or allergies to snake venom or something like that should not take the vaccine. The current advice is that if you have had an allergic reaction to a vaccine or a vaccine component before, definitely worth talking talking to your doctor uh, about that before you get the vaccine. But so far, it doesn't look like it's really uh, going to disrupt access and use. And the good news too, David, is that with uh, good treatments for allergic reactions, uh, these very rare uh, side effects are completely manageable. Dr. McCullough, also give us a sense of the challenges, the hurdles perhaps on distribution, uh, because the notion of distributing 300 million doses twice in the United States sounds overwhelming. Yeah. We already have heard some talks about maybe some shipments have been too cold and so they couldn't use the vaccine. How difficult is the logistical problem? You know, they, they are very challenging. We have not had to mount a vaccination campaign in the United States, anything like this since polio in the 1950s. And this is much larger than, than that one. So this is unprecedented. I know people use that word a lot in the pandemic. The first round that's going on now will hope, hopefully let us work out some of the kinks. This is a very well-controlled, tight, limited distribution to healthcare workers and to nursing homes. Uh, and as you said, there have been a few bumps there. Where things are going to get more challenging is as we move beyond these very first priority groups into trying to reach all of the uh, elderly Americans who are at a higher risk for or COVID complications and all of the frontline workers uh, uh, and all of the essential workers, uh, teachers, um, people who are working in prisons and so forth, that is going to be more complex. And as you were just talking about with your last guest, uh, the people who have been most hard hit by this pandemic, they uh, tend to have less access to care to begin with. There's a lot of distrust, uh, particularly in communities of color around uh, the vaccine. So this is going to take not only a major logistical challenge, but also a major uh, public education effort and a lot of engagement with community leaders and a lot of transparency and sharing the data about how everything is going so far. And again, so far, it looks really good. Uh, the vaccines look very effective. The side effects look very rare uh, and temporary beyond, uh, you know, you will likely get a sore arm and feel uh, bad for a day or so after these vaccines. But beyond that, it looks very good uh, from the vaccine standpoint. Very challenging, though, ahead from the distribution standpoint. Yeah, we never want to lose track of the fact that, as far as I can tell, this is almost a miracle to have a vaccine this fast in these circumstances. Yeah. Doctor, we always love talking with you. That's Dr. Mark McClellan of the Duke Margolis Center.
Coming up, we're going to talk that, about that massive computer hack of government computers with Teresa Payton. She's a cyber expert who served as the chief information officer under President George W. Bush. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We learned about a massive hack of government computers this week that has the White House now having daily meetings on the subject to figure out what happened and what can be done about it. We turn now to a true expert in cybersecurity. She is Teresa F Payton. She was chief information officer in the White House under George W. Bush. She is now the CEO of Fortalis. So thank you so much for being with us, Ms. Payton. First of all, give us a sense, how big a problem is this? Well, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm approaching a 9, and it's not just about what we know. It's all the things that we don't know at this point in the investigation. Well, so that, start with that, first of all. Do we know, uh, does the government know at this point, how many agencies may have been affected, how much data may have been affected? They don't know, and that's the challenging part. This is, this is a cyber attack like none other that we have worked in the past. Uh, first of all, it is installed in U.S. military. Our allies use it. Our departments and agencies use it. The private sector uses it. And the challenge is, is that if you had certain versions of the software, the malware was installed inside the SolarWinds software. And so if you were using a version of that, it gave them an opportunity for the cyber operatives with nefarious intent. Uh, right now, the investigation points towards Russia. Russia, for the record, denies it. Um, they pretty much always deny it. Uh, but uh, so, you know, the investigation ongoing. But for all intents and purposes, once that malware has been downloaded, embedded in the software that's supposed to be a security product, it then gave them the opportunity to create what is referred to in the industry as God access or a God door. Now, whether or not they walk through every single God door that was potentially out there remains to be seen. But when you have God access, that means you look like you have the master key. It looks like you belong there. So other security products and tools are not going to try to kick you out. So who knows? And, it, and this is potentially dating back as early as March 2020, which means they had unfettered access for months. So who knows? It could be emails. They could have changed data. They could have deleted data. They could be embedded so deeply into network that you'll never be able to trust them again. You'll actually have to build something brand new and abandon what you have because you don't know if you can get them out. Ms. Payton, just hold on one moment. I apologize for interrupting, but a, a headline is just crossing. It has to do with cyber, but not exactly the area you're involved in. A group of states now has sued Google, uh, alleging uh, abuse of dominance of the search market. This is a monopolization case involving the search market. You remember yesterday, Texas led a group of states that actually alleged uh, abuse of dominant position in the advertising market. This is search market. We'll bring you more on that as, as, as we get information. So I uh, apologize again, Ms. Payton, for, for interrupting you. How sophisticated was this attack, as far as we can tell, you just described, they really imitated as if the, they were the master. Yeah, well, what's interesting is uh, in the days and weeks to come, we may finally learn how did they get access to solar wind. And oftentimes in investigations like this, they operate at stealth and with a level of expertise, but oftentimes the way that got in was not stealthy. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, do we learn, you know, some security researchers said they found in the past weak passwords. Uh, sometimes in cases like this, the stealthiness happens after a very old school way of getting in, which is a social engineering email. Employee clicks on the link and bam, they're in. And once they're in, then they go into stealth mode. So it'll be interesting to see what the point of intrusion was. But once they were in, because they had written the malware themselves that had been downloaded, then they had the access they needed. So that's the part of this that really requires very high level of capability, intelligence, and patience. Whoever did this was definitely playing the long game to get the biggest payout they could. Just very briefly at the hearing, what does this mean about the priorities given this by the incoming President Joe Biden? Well, um, my advice to the incoming president and the outgoing president is the two teams need to work together on this. Um, this is a hack that could potentially 
be impacting businesses, the U.S. government could be impacting us for years to come. We do not know the full extent of access and potential damages that were created as part of this hack. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. That was very informative. That's Teresa Payton. She is Fortalis Solutions CEO. Well, the second hour of Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio, that does it for the TV portion. I'm David Weston, and this is Bloomberg.